but you need to see how Kirill is going with the prototype. This will be the next video, so subscribe if you don't want to miss. Thanks for watching. Unfortunately, there is no artificial intelligence that should write the code for me. Not yet, at least. I have to do everything myself and creating a modern software product is a complex process. Let's see what I need to do to create Transcripta. Naturally, I'm going to do microservices. I did a quick math and identified around half a dozen microservices. This should be enough for the start. There will be a microservice for file uploads, another one for sending emails, one more for transcribing audio, registration, payments, and user dashboard, and most likely a few more for the admin interface. I will try to write every microservice in a different programming language because I want to pick only the best tools for the job. The microservices need to communicate to each other, so I will need a distributed, highly available Kafka cluster. There is no way I can build transcript without event sourcing. To deploy this elegant and simple system, I will certainly need a Kubernetes cluster. After analyzing the future monthly costs, I have ended up with an estimate of $2000 per month to host all of this, plus I will be hiring a dedicated site reliability engineer to take care of all of this. I think it's quite cheap for starting a new serious tech startup. If you didn't realize that it was a joke, I have some bad news for you. Stop reading so many blog articles and believing that everything Google or Amazon does makes sense for every single software product. It doesn't and it never did. What makes sense for a small tech product is to skip writing code at all. What we are going to do is to embrace the no-code approach. Look, it's really simple. I will take Zapier to connect a couple of services together. I will create a user registration form in Google Forms connect Google Forms to Dropbox and then link Dropbox folder to some existing audio transcription service. Somewhere in the middle I will also connect PayPal to collect payments and Gmail to send email notifications when transcription is ready. It will be tricky to wrap all of this into a custom design, most likely I will never be able to add any new features and the whole setup will be more fragile than Uber's business model, but hey, at least I wrote zero lines of code and only had to pay for a dozen of third-party services. Alright, alright, of course I'm just messing with you guys, let's get to real work. I'm going to use Ruby on Rails for Transcripta. Ruby is the programming language I know best and it's also the one I really love writing code with. It could be fun to try some new technologies, but having limited amount of time it's always better to go with familiar tools, in this case with the good old majestic Rails monolith. I'm going to rely on cloud services as much as I can, primarily on the Amazon Web Services. I already decided to use Amazon Transcribe to do the actual speech-to-text transcription. Amazon Transcribe relies heavily on S3 for storing the source and the result files, and in any case it makes sense to use S3 for file uploads as a reliable and relatively cheap solution. Additionally, I will use simple notification service to deliver S3 notifications about finished transcriptions directly to the Rails application. With this simple architecture in mind, I can start writing some code. I've generated the new Ruby on Rails application behind the scenes. I will use a lot of Rails specific terminology, but the general concepts are applicable to any modern web framework. My goal right now is to implement the most important feature of the product, transcribing audio to text. I don't need to add user registration, email notifications or even the payment part at this point. I like to start writing as little code as possible to make something work and then iteratively extend it with new features. To make this prototype look decent, I'm using Twitter Bootstrap. I won't need most of which once the final design is ready, but for rapid prototyping it's the best. First thing I've added is a new Rails controller to render the homepage of the application. Each method in the controller is handling a request to your application. I need to map the root path of the app to the index method of the newly created controller. I also need to create a template known as view in Rails, that will be rendered when index method is invoked. Then, I've created a simple form to upload new transcriptions. I'm using a lot of CSS classes from the Twitter bootstrap. This way, I don't need to write much CSS myself, but I will still get a nicely looking form. I've actually copied the whole form from the bootstrap docs and then just adjusted it to my needs. 
I also copied the file format requirements from the Amazon Transcribe documentation. Transcripta supports only what Amazon supports. This form is a fake. It does nothing yet, but I like to start from the front end and go down the stack. Now I need to connect this form to the database. The only database table I need at this point is transcription. In Rails, you rarely work with the database directly. Instead, you're using Active Record, the object relational mapping solution. The transcription table doesn't need many columns right now, but I'm still adding the state and the user ID because I know that I will need them in the future. There is a resources method in Rails router that will generate standard RESTful routes for my model. These routes will point to a transcriptions controller. I'm also changing the root path to point to the new method of this controller. I actually don't need the home controller I've created a minute ago. I could have used Rails CLI to generate the transcriptions controller, but somehow I always end up creating controllers manually. The new method needs to initialize a new not yet persisted transcription object. The index method fetches all the transcriptions from the database. I'm moving the template with the transcription form to a new location because this is the one we want to render when the new method of transcriptions controller is invoked. File uploads are going to be handled by Active Storage. It's part of the Rails framework and it makes handling files extremely easy. There are native integrations with cloud storages, including S3. I've created a new S3 bucket just for the development, with the plan to automate the real ones later, once Transcripto is getting closer to the release. Active Storage needs few extra database tables and config files. All of them are installed with a separate command you see on the screen. I also need to run the database migrations so that Rails creates all the tables and indices for my models. To add a file attachment to the transcription model, I only need to add a special method has one attached. This is enough to make Active Storage handle the file uploads and the relationship of them with transcriptions. With the persistence layer configured, I am replacing the fake form we had with a real one generated with the help of Rails form helpers. This helpers will make sure that generated HTML form points to the correct path and sends the payload in a certain format. You might notice that I am using the new transcription object initialized in the controller and I am using the source file active storage attachment inside the file field helper. The form will send all the required parameters to the controller but controller still needs to do something with them. I am filtering the form params in a private method and then I am using these params to create a new transcription and save it to the database. If it will save, then Rails will redirect the user to the list of all transcriptions, and if it won't save, I will simply render the new transcription page again. After 30 minutes after the start of the development, I have a simple form to create a new transcription. While it's uploaded to a tree and After 30 minutes after the start of development, oh come on. File is uploaded to S3 and can see the list of I didn't change the index template. After 30 minutes after the start of the development, I have a simple form to create a new transcription. File is uploaded to S3 and I can see the list of all the transcriptions with the file in. It's time to add the actual transcription. Transcription takes time, so it makes sense to do it in a background task. Rails has ActiveJob, a library responsible for background processing. Similarly to Active Storage, it integrates with multiple different queuing systems like Sidekick or Rescue and provides a unified interface on top of them. For this prototype, I'm going to use a default async provider. It will run the background job in another thread. It's not suitable for the production environment, but we are not in production yet. I am generating the new job with the Rails CLI somewhat inconsistently with my habit of creating controllers by hand. I want to schedule this job right after transcription is created. To do this, I am using active record callbacks. Rails models allow you to execute code at different parts of the record's lifecycle. Armed with the AWS SDK documentation, I am starting to implement the scheduling of the transcription. I want to remind that I am not trying to write the perfect code here. My goal is still to get something working as fast as possible, improvements will come later. I will use the transcription ID inside the transcribe job's name so that I can easily connect one to another. 
For the time being, I will just hardcode the English language in this API call. Same goes for the media format. By default, Amazon will save the result to its own S3 bucket. I want to retain the full control over the data and for this I need to specify my own bucket. This way, transcriptions will be stored till the user decides to delete them. Once again, I am creating the bucket by hand and then specify it in the code together with the output object key. Final thing I need to do is to specify the location of the source file and this location must be inside S3. Luckily, we already store all uploaded files in S3, meaning that we can simply fetch the file location from the transcription record. I've tried to schedule the job from the Rails development console and discovered a couple of bugs. Amazon API appeared to be very picky about the source file location formatting and I also used the wrong bucket name thanks to my mad copy and paste skills. After fixing these bugs, I got my first transcribe job running. There is currently no link between the transcribe job in Amazon and my source code, so I spent a bit of time creating a few simple methods to fetch the job status from the inside of my model. I will rewrite all of this code after I am done with the prototype, because I don't really want to make all those API calls all the time. But for now, I want to understand how this API works and this slow and ugly code is the best way to do it. I am invoking those methods in the list of all transcriptions, so that it's clear in the web UI which transcriptions are still pending. I've also tried to just fetch the URL to the final transcription result, but it didn't really work. Instead of the URL, I need to call the S3 API to get the contents of the transcript. I'm adding yet another controller for transcripts. Idea is that each transcription eventually has a transcript and transcripts controller is the one responsible for rendering them. Inside roots, I'm nesting transcripts under the transcriptions pass. There is no actual transcript model, this route is only to generate a good looking URL and follow Ruby on Rails conventions. I am updating the transcript link to use the newly generated root helper. And I am preparing some basic code to get the transcription from the database and render the transcript. Transcript is going to be a method in the transcription model. To get the transcription result, I am using the AWS S3 API. The JSON file I need is easy to find because its name has a transcription record ID. I don't care about the complete contents of this JSON file, so I am adding a new method to get only the actual text from this data. It took me a while to figure out under which key this text is located and I've edited out the embarrassing attempts to do so. After doing a couple of small changes in the transcript template, I can finally see the result in the application directly. It doesn't look nice, so I spend a bit of time to improve the formatting of the text. At this point, the prototype is more or less ready. Thanks to AWS, Ruby and Rails, I was able to complete it in a bit more than one hour. As I still have some time left, I am going to extend the transcription form with the fields for the language and number of speakers. I hardcoded those values earlier. I am not going to show you this part of coding, because I think you already saw enough code to get bored. Instead, let's rest for 5 seconds and look at my doc. Look how cute he is, Jesus Christ. Ok, ready to jump to the final part of the episode? You might be thinking, this guy just wrote a bunch of shit code. And I did. There is some real horrible code, like this or that, or also this part. Well, there is also no user registration, no payment, no nothing, and that's ok, because it's just a prototype. But it's a working prototype, because even in its current form it does the main and only feature of the transcriptor. It transcribes audio to text and it does it very well and really fast. Also, I've tested a lot of assumptions and I found some caveats and have a clear understanding how to move this prototype to become a real application. But to be able to make it, I need Leo to send me the final application design. I hope he didn't choose AI for that, I don't want any surrealistic vaginas and toddlers in transcriptor. In the next episode of Making a Product, Leo will finish the design of the web application. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss the new episodes when they come out.